Okay, so let's get started. Uh, I hope uh, all of you had a chance or, uh, to have a break, whether you talk with each other or uh, decided to have a quiet break. Um, it's my honor to be moderating the upcoming panel here. Uh, for those of you who, is who have just joined, my name is Leila Zia. I'm the head of research here at Wikimedia Foundation and one of the co-organizers of Wiki Workshop. And in the next 45 minutes, um, I'm going to be talking with uh, the four speakers of the panel that you see on the screen, and I'm going to introduce them to you momentarily about inclusive collaboration towards high quality digital common knowledge. Uh, so let me uh, introduce the speakers to you. Jérôme Herrou is uh, an assistant research professor at the French National Center for Scientific Research, CNRS. Um, he's a research affiliate at the Center for Law and Economics at ETH Zurich and a faculty associate at the Berkman, Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University. We have invited Jerome here because he has, um, he, his background is in behavioral uh, economics uh, and he, his research primarily operates at the boundaries between psychology, economics, and computational social science. His current research uh, interests uh, are on studying how people deal with their decision-making biases as well as the determinants and consequences of communication style and leadership in virtual teamwork. We're glad to have you here, Jerome. Um, our next panelist is Benjamin Mako Hill. Um, he's an assistant professor in the University of Washington Department of Communications and adjunct assistant professor in the Department of Human Centered Design and Engineering and Computer Science and Engineering, an affiliate fac faculty in the Center for Statistics and the Social Sciences, the eScience Institute, and many more places. Uh, Mako is also a faculty associate at Berkman Klein. He studies, uh, he and his lab study collective action in the online communities, and they seek to understand why some attempts um, to build collaborative production networks like Wikipedia or Linux work well, while others um, do not um, attract volunteers. Our third panelist is Christina Lerman. Uh, Christina is a project leader at the Information Science Institute at the University of Southern California. Um, she holds a joint appointment as a research associate professor in the USC Better B School of Engineering's Computer Science Department. Her research focus on, is on applying network and machine learning based methods to problems in social computing. And we're glad to have her here, particularly for some of her recent work uh, on cognitive bias and its impact on um, collaborative networks. And our last panelist is Misha Teplitsky. He's an assistant professor at the School of Information, University of Michigan. He's an uh, alumni of Wiki Workshop. Um, we are uh, really glad to have him back. His research is at the intersection of science, um, science of science, sociology of organizations, computational social science. He studies how social and organizational factors affect scientific discovery. Um, previously, uh, Misha held uh, postdoc at the Laboratory of Innovation Science at Harvard, and he received his PhD in sociology from University of Chicago, where he was a member of the Knowledge Lab. Uh, thank you so much uh, to our panel for showing up. And uh, with that, I'm going to switch to the first series of questions. And as a reminder for the audience, the first 25 to 30 minutes will be the us, the panel, discussing uh, different questions, and then we're going to come back to you for the last 10 or 15 minutes for questions. Please continue raising your questions in the chat. Isaac will keep track of them, and you can raise them when it's your turn yourself, or Isaac can read out your question to the panel. So, uh, Christina, uh, I would like to start by you. Um, so, um, as we all know, Wikipedia has been a platform for uh, crowdsource and uh, collaborative network collaboration over the past uh, almost two decades. Um, and today, while it uh, serves as a project with high quality content, we also see a lot of challenges around the project. And that's kind of the topic of this panel is, is primarily focusing on how we can create an inclusive collaborative environment in Wikipedia um, that can 
help the project continue to have high quality content and provide it in, uh, as part of the digital comments. I want to start by you partly because part of your research focuses on understanding the effects of cognitive bias on the solutions uh, identified through collective processes. You have particularly studied SAC exchange, and I wanted to ask you to share with us some of the things you have learned through your research. Sure, thank you. I'm going to try to summarize my talk in about four minutes. So yes, I do study the interactions between individual cognitive biases that people use to make decisions and, and the platform's algorithmic biases and how it impacts the wisdom of crowds applications. So if you're not familiar with what cognitive biases are, these are actually based on the uh, simple mental uh, shortcuts or heuristic, cognitive heuristics that people use to make, uh, make quick and uh, less accurate decisions. Um, and so these cognitive biases and introduce, uh, a cognitive heuristic introduce uh, uh, well kind of statistical biases into people's actions. So what types of cognitive biases? You know, psychologists actually um, enumerated more than 100 different biases or uh, the shortcuts that people use to make decisions. But in the context of crowdsourcing implications, the ones I actually focused my attention on were mostly position bias. For example, if you look at studies where people pay uh, where on the web page do people pay most attention to, for Western cultures, it happens to be like the upper left and mostly the upper uh, of, the, of the pages. So whatever show information that shows up at the top of a page, more pe people will be more likely to see it. And then there was also social influence bias, you know, web, different web platforms uh, surf, uh, show what other people like, you know, for example, number of likes or other kind of hot or popular items, they, they, they uh, highlight them to people. Um, and then cognitive biases often interact with algorithmic bias. And what, by algorithmic bias, that what I mean is that, uh, yes, websites either they uh, show how popular items are, or maybe they will actually rank items by, you know, they hope to do it by quality, but most of the time they rank items by popularity. For example, uh, the number one top ranked item is the one that uh, is more popular, for example, uh, the sort of items of popularity. And we have actually explored this interaction between cognitive and algorithmic biases, specifically in the context of stack exchange. So because uh, which happens, you know, stack exchange wants to get the community to help discover best answers to questions. And specifically, both through statistical analysis, through online experiments on Amazon Turks, we found that people, instead of um, looking through and uh, evaluating all answers to a question, people tend to focus on answers that are near the top, you know, that have more words, so maybe they've been selected by the asker as the best question. And moreover, the more answers there are that are available, the more people rely on this shortcut, so this simple heuristics, by uh, choosing the top answer, choosing the answer that has already been accepted, you know, in order to upward, you know, select the best answers. So then when, when Stack Exchange actually aggregates all these decisions, all these upwards from people, in actually suboptimal answers might be the one that float up to the top rather than the best quality answers. So that's why actually we, and also in more recent research, we're showing how these, uh, this uh, interaction with algorithmic, the way algorithms display items can actually produce unstable rankings in, in which um, items that are, uh, you know, next time you run a similar experiment, for example, different items will, uh, or different answers will rise up to the top. So we are investigating also methods, not only to quantify how much these biases interact, how much they affect the quality of solutions the crowds discover, but also methods to try to reduce the biases and, and really enable the community to discover best quality answers. Thank you very much for that, Christina. So Misha, I want to turn to you for uh, our second question, and I want to ask you to talk about uh, your recent research, the research that you and your, your colleagues have done. On, in understanding the effect of bias on Wikipedia and how Wikipedia has managed bias in a productive way towards quality content uh, production. Can you speak to what you have learned through this research? Sure, so, um, <clears throat> hi everybody, and thanks for having me. Um, it's kind of a quick rundown of the, of the work that we will mention. Um, so this was a recent paper called Wisdom of Followers Crowds. Um, and what we did there, uh, myself and uh, uh, a team of sociologists, information scientists, we um, 
uh, try to go after the sort of classic question of diversity, team diversity and performance, and particularly cognitive diversity, which is um, often really hard to measure in, in a real setting. So of course, easier uh, online and Wikipedia makes it especially a, a good case. Um, and so we were trying to understand uh, the role of this sort of newish or increasingly important dimension of diversity, people's differences on ideology. Um, and so what we did, you know, so you might think that cognitive diversity is generally good um, for um, kind of like surfacing new ideas and let people combine them. Um, of course, you know, as we kind of like look around the world, like ideology has this um, other component too, where it's like increasingly tied to uh, our general identities, increasingly like effective polarization is what some people call it. So for example, if you ask people, will they marry a Republican or a Democrat? Like increasingly people say no, depending on who they are, things like that. Um, and so we're trying to see how this kind of newish dimension of diversity plays out in on Wikipedia. And so we um, looked at uh, editors of uh, you know, about 200,000 pages and um, tried to understand their kind of like ideological position based on what, they, what kinds of political pages they edit, conservative ones or liberal ones. And so with that measure in mind, what we found kind of surprisingly to us was that the more ideologically, ideologically diverse the team, the better the page. Um, and this was a pretty robust relationship that we basically couldn't make go away no matter what we tried. And it kind of works in a, turned out to work in a, I guess, predicted way where the relationship is especially strong where the domain is politics, less so when it's kind of like less related to politics. So social issues, the relationship is weaker, but science page is even weaker, but it still appears a little bit. And so the paper tries to, um, like seeing this positive relationship, which we don't seem to see anywhere, like see very few places in the world where like ideological differences are actually good, um, or seem to be, you know, creating better products. So what drives this kind of pattern? So, you know, at a micro level, we see that people in ideologically diverse teams, um, discussed fewer topics in the kind of semantic sense, but in more ways. So they used more kind of unique words to discuss a smaller set of topics. So there was sort of like a more concentration effect, we might say. Um, and brought in um, sort of the rest of the paper, and in general, I think this uh, um, it kind of raised more questions than it answered. So it's like, we see this positive relationship, it's nice to see, but what, what sort of, why is it appearing here and not elsewhere? Um, and so if you sort of survey, you look around online spaces and I think a few things jump out, which are sort of not things we answer in the paper, but I think questions that the paper raises is, um, you know, so one is sort of, there's of course big self-selection of people into Wikipedia. So the kinds of people selecting into it might have ideological differences, but might be more uh, open to teamwork and disagreements than others. Um, so there's a question of like, self-selection and brand that Wikipedia has and how well people know that brand when they choose to join or not. Um, one sort of an, another kind of a seems to be characteristic is that you know Wikipedia has you know, like one page for one topic. It doesn't have three pages for one topic. So that sort of like forces everybody into the same sandbox, which is pretty unique and we don't see in other places like um, you know Twitter, etc. And I think lastly, and I think maybe more, most kind of like open to study and experimentation is the role of oversight. You know, Wikipedia is much more bureaucratic and much more kind of levels of oversight than, uh, again, like Twitter and things like that. So one question I think that at least is pressing in my mind is like, what, like how much oversight is good? Um, in Wikipedia, it's a, I, I think fair to say there's a good amount and it seems to have productive effects for this kind of sensitive kind of collaboration. Um, is that necessary or is that optimal? I think is a kind of interesting question. So that's uh, sort of the rundown of our paper. Yeah, thank you for that. And I think that gives us a nice segue to Jerome's uh, work. Jerome, if we can talk with you, if you can talk a little bit about more about your research in this space, specifically as we uh, talk about uh, oversight governance, uh, uh, moderation on Wikipedia. Uh, so your part of your research focuses on the effect of uh, structures on uh, minorities. Can you talk with us a little bit more about what you have learned in your research? Yeah, sure. Um, well, 
first, thanks for having me. Um, so I think I'm going to start just to build intuition for the audience as to where I'm going um, with a couple of quotes. And then I'll tie back to what Misha was saying and develop the argument that I want to make in those, in those few minutes. So the first quote that I have for you, for you guys is from Virginia Woolf. It's a quote from the 30s, uh, an essay that she wrote, which is called A Room of One's Own. So I quote, there was an enormous body of masculine opinion to the effect that nothing could be expected of women intellectually. Even if her father did not read out loud those opinions, any girl could read them for herself. And the reading, even in the 19th century, must have lowered her vitality and told profoundly upon her work. There will always have been that assertion, you cannot do this, you're incapable of doing that, to protest against or to overcome. So that's, you know, from a quote from a woman, it's, it's pretty old, uh, much more recent, uh, a quote coming from uh, somebody who, uh, who, who is black, Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, who made a speech when he received his doctoral degree, uh, I think it was in astrophysics or something like that, uh, the first one to get such a, such, uh, such a degree uh, in the US uh, in the 90s. And he says in this speech, in the perception of society, my athletic talents are genetic. I am a likely mugger or rapist. My academic failures are expected and my academic successes are attributed to others. To spend most of my life fighting these attitudes, levies an emotional tax that is a form of intellectual emasculation. Now, what does all of this have to do with Wikipedia? Well, we know that there's a significant gender gap uh, and you know, an ethnic minority gap on, on Wikipedia. And I want to point out right away that, you know, we must question whether this matters per se, right? Uh, and I think it matters uh, because it creates bias. It lowers the, the, the quality of the content just because people who, can, who could take different stands on a topic are simply not represented. And it reproduces stereotypes when people look up for information online. And so basically my message uh, in these few minutes is that psychology may be the most fundamental bottleneck to the integration of ethnic minorities and, and women, as opposed to the bureaucratization of Wikipedia, uh, which is real, but which is only an aggravating factor, in my opinion. And we'll probably return to that. Um, so, you know, if we think about many of the users who are with us today, they're probably early, many of them are probably early enthusiasts who found it amazing that you could argue with people from all around the world for the better good, right? And as Misha was saying, uh, Wikipedia has been amazing at creating rules that focus the debate on, what, on the debate on what people say, as opposed to who says it, that's the neutrality of point of view. Um, and that has been so successful, actually 15 years ago, it's hard to go back, but nobody would have predicted that the very best articles on Wikipedia would turn out to be those that are highly controversial uh, and attract a lot of different viewpoints, right? Uh, part of the featured articles on Wikipedia are the ones on Barack Obama, on Jesus. Uh, that would have been totally unpredictable 15 years ago. Now, what I want to point out here is that this whole system of managing different viewpoints and you know, political biases and opinions rests on contributors being resilient when they argue their points. That is, they're ready, or even they enjoy arguing their points for hours with each other. Now, if you got the intuition of those quotes that I had at the very beginning, my point is that this is not the case for many different strata of society, and in particular minorities, and in particular women. And so that could be a major barrier to entry. And those are not only just quotes, because in the 20 past years of research in the behavioral sciences, we actually collected a very vast amount of experimental and field evidence uh, for the relevance of those quotes in people's real lives. And I can share all the, the references. I'm going, I'm going to allude to a bunch of research. But we know that women and minorities are much more risk averse than the rest of the population. They're much less self-confident. 
uh, and they hate competition. They don't like to compete with others directly. And so people doing field studies in psychology and economics, they've shown that those differences, uh, they actually explain a substantial fraction of students' orientation choices as early as high school, controlling for academic achievements. And even within a given sector, uh, more competitive individuals are estimated to earn 10% more than others for the same qualifications. And that hits particularly women and minorities. Um, so I think that we should keep all of that in mind when we think about why we want and how we want to address systematic biases that arise from lack of participation from certain strata of society on Wikipedia. Uh, and we also have a bunch of field interventions that tell us that the effect of those differences are actually very large. Uh, so, you know, just citing one and then, and then concluding, I don't know how much I've been, I've been talking for now, uh, um, I, could, I could talk more, but it, it's pretty obvious to everybody that when you go to college for the first time, it's pretty common for people to experience social setbacks, feelings of isolation, this is a challenging new environment, you're far away from your family. But black students, they're much more likely to interpret this as evidence that they do not belong at university, that this is something that's related to their identity, to their race. And so in one science paper among several, what people did is that they just ran a quick social belonging intervention without those students knowing, having a control and treatment, and they just uh, manipulated them so that so as to attribute those setbacks to general factors that are common to everyone and absolutely not related to race. And this simple intervention creates very large difference in terms of their academic achievements three years down the line. And they measure those academic achievements, but not only academic achievements, self-reported health, uh, depression, the accessibility of negative racial stereotypes, self-doubts, uh, and also subjective happiness. So, so my point is that how do we make sure that women and minorities feel like they belong in a space where people enjoy arguing, sometimes even for its own sake, right? And this is much more complex a problem to solve than simplifying the contribution process at a technical level uh, that is create a visual editor or something. It will require a lot of creativity, which should happen in the intersection between the behavioral sciences and platform design. Um, and you know, a few leads there, we know that teamwork is efficient at, uh, at having uh, increasing uh, women's uh, resilience in the face of competitiveness. Uh, so we need newbies to feel embedded in the social network right from their very first experience. Uh, maybe we could think about a menu of help buttons so that newbies would feel like they're welcome and supported also right from the start and that this is not about a competition. And part of the challenge here is that it does not seem reasonable to expect this from active users who already have a lot on their plate. So really the question to me is, how can we engineer such processes within groups of newbies that share some interest? How can we connect them while shielding them from self-assertive or bureaucratic behavior that achieves so much in other domains of Wikipedia for other kind of populations? I think this is what we need to tackle. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Jérôme. And Meiko, I think this brings us naturally to you and to your research and your lab's research. You focus on understanding the trade-offs between engagement and quality. Can you share with us what you have learned through your research? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, so my research is really focused on life cycles around knowledge commons and online communities. And most of our work sort of builds um, these builds on these sort of attempts to create data sets of lots of attempts to build communities like wikis. So in one case that involved looking at a whole bunch of the uh, kind of online collaborative encyclopedia projects that were created before Wikipedia with a way of trying to, you know, uncover those dynamics. Um, I think much of it has looked at other wikis. So um, uh, big data sets of attempts of wikis from Wikia or from, you know, open source software projects. Now, one thing that I suspect a number of people on the uh, 
sort of watching this, um, no, probably not everybody, is that that English Wikipedia peaked in terms of the number of active editors in early 2007, and other language Wikipedias have peaked at different points in time, um, uh, although many around sort of that time. Uh, many others are still like growing, but our work has shown that the this pattern, uh, which you may have seen uh, if you look at uh, many language Wikipedias of sort of this really rapid sort of um, super linear growth that transitions really rapidly into periods of um, sort of slow decline is actually, uh, you know, happening at different scales, but it's actually a very general pattern around big sort of successful communities. We see these very general kind of patterns. Um, now, uh, you know, when we look at the early stages of communities, we find it should come as no surprise, and I think it connects to a lot of the things that people have already said um, in the panel, that one important feature of sort of like healthy growth and the sort of like the communities that become big and successful tends to be uh, openness, uh, open to um, and able to involve contributions from lots of kinds of people. Um, communities with relatively lightweight forms of governments, governance make it off the, um, make, it's, it's easier for them to get off the ground. Um, but as you suggested, Leila, there are a lot of, um, there seem to be trade-offs between a lot of the kinds of things, you know, I, I hear a lot of people on the panel talking about like, on the one case, sort of engagement, and on the other case, sort of maintaining quality. And I think that um, some of our work um, has built on some work that other people have done to really unpack this dynamic set of trade-offs between engaging more people in ways that I think are in line with what Jerome has mentioned and maintaining quality in ways that connect to what Christina um, uh, and also Misha have, have spoken to. Uh, I think that part of the story seems to be that, or at least part of my story, I guess, uh, is that this is not, um, uh, it's not a story of, of, of sort of the, 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 the spigot being turned off, of the stream sort of slowing down. I mean, that's part of it, but there's also a big, increase that we see in these communities that transition into periods of sort of maturity and decline. Um, there are big increases in newcomer rejection, which leads to decreases in newcomer retention. And this was shown first by um, Aaron Hafker and Stu Geiger and Jonathan Morgan, I'm sure some subset of whom are watching this uh, um, or will later. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, I think that, that uh, that we've shown that these dynamics also seem to play out across lots of large communities. That communities succeed because they're open, um, or in part because they're open, but they become increasingly closed in ways that they mean that they do a less good job of integrating people who are showing up um, at the door um, over time. Um, and this also seems to be a general pattern. Now, I think that that um, uh, we we tend to find that people that are early on in communities tend to consolidate power as their interests sort of diverge from the rest of um, the the participants. So so I think that this is a big question, and this is something that that, that a lot of our sort of uh, recent work in the Community Data Science Collective, my sort of research group, has been focusing on, um, uh, and a sort of understanding what's going on. And our answer seems to be that there's that there really is this trade-off that emerges over time between the initial sort of need to build a community, to build sort of a stock of value, to get lots of people in, um, and the need that emerges over time to protect it from people that are showing up and have a desire to have things sort of look one way, the benefits their you know, business or point of view. And so you build a whole bunch of structure, really what you think of as like, like governance structures, which I think correspond, um, uh, which might be ways of working or ways of talking, which I think correspond to a lot of things that Misha and Jerome talks about, um, in order to maintain and manage quality. And the effect of that um, uh, tends to be uh, this th real trade-off in the ability to engage people, sometimes in ways that are that you know sort of like sis very systematically across different demographic groups. Early on, when the stakes are lower, you can be more flexible. Um, and so I'm really interested in the way in which these, these, those sort of dynamics um, begin to play out over time. Thank you so much, Michael and everyone on the panel. So I would like to give us all on the panel maybe um, in uh, three or four minutes to ask each other questions or if you have comments for each other uh, based on what you have heard. And then let's spend the last 10 minutes of it uh, for the audience to ask any questions they may have. I see that already the queue is building. 
Um, and I have a thing that Jerome has already a question for Mako. So go ahead, Jerome. Yeah, um, just just as a way to 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 develop this conversation a bit, I think you know everybody agrees to this to this trade-off that needs to be solved, uh, and it seems to be a very challenging a very challenging thing to do. Um, and you know, Mako, you know you know a lot about all kinds of different wikis in different development stages and Wikipedia in particular. I would be interested to know what you think about about the possibility of two tier systems um, whereby we need to maintain the bureaucracy and 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 uh, and ensure quality on the one hand, but on the other hand, if we want to integrate more community members uh, and get some low hanging fruits uh, elsewhere um, get those people to contribute, we also need them to uh, have fun, have an easy access, be able to connect to each other. I know there's been some experiment about, you know, having a sandbox, having articles pre-validated uh, by an experienced community member before they get in, but that kind of kills kind of the fun or, you know, your direct impact of it. What do you think about this being a potential way forward? Um, so I love the idea of a two-tiered system in a sandbox, in part because uh, a little piece of Wikipedia history is that Wikipedia was originally created as the second tier sandbox for a different encyclopedia project called Newpedia, which was going to be a big professional sort of or more professional sort of reviewed system. You built the open sandbox and in large part, I would argue, because of its openness, it was able to succeed to the point that basically people sort of forgot about Newpedia and it sort of fell apart. I think that the trade-off is actually, I mean, that's not a way of really answering your question. Um, I think it's interesting. I think that in practice, it's difficult to do. I do think that that um, Wikipedia and lots of other wikis exist in this broad ecosystem. There are a huge proportion, I know um, uh, Isaac Johnson's on the call, um, uh, sort of has shown that like a huge proportion of people are consuming information from Wikipedia in places other than Wikipedia. Um, and so there, there exists this broader ecosystem um, with, which is already out there. Um, uh, I think that figuring out how to design those tiers and ensure that you have um, sort of participation in places where it's possible while also sort of like having it work in other, um, uh, having things sort of move easily between them can be really effective. And I think that you've seen very successful examples of this in free and open source software as well. So um, I think that there's potential, but I think that, uh, I think that it's, it's, it's hard to do. Thank you. Um, uh, any other folks on the panel have comments for each other or questions? Maybe one mm -hmm. or two more? So um, I've been actually very paying to this, uh, attention to this interesting discussion, thinking actually what can platform do specifically to encourage uh, participation by minorities or to highlight inclusiveness and highlight you know, newcomers or something like this. And, and I'd like to be optimistic, but you know, so far I'm going to talk about you know pessimistic note. We are going to have a paper. We have a paper that was accepted to ICWSM for this year that shows uh, outcome of stack exchange uh, efforts to try to uh, encourage newcomers. You know, so they also had the same problem that there's been uh, overall there's been attrition over a long period of time, and new and, and basically newcomers don't feel welcome. So they try to. One strategy they try to implement is to have a newcomer badge, you know, so to highlight contributions by first time users to help hopefully to make community more welcoming to them. So we actually try to measure ca causal impact of this newcomer badge on behaviors. And this is long story short is basically not not much impact. It did not help at all. It did decrease in the short term. It did increase number of negative comments newcomers received, but overall it did not help stem the, you know, the rejection and the flow of new uh, outflow of newcomers to the platform. So that makes me a little bit pessimistic, but maybe, it, I mean, that, that doesn't say that there is no things that platforms can do, but we need to try in this A-B testing way, maybe try many different approaches to try to find how we can actually make people feel more welcome and more uh, contribute uh, more widely. Christina, one question for you. Is this study also taking into account the gender of the contributors or that information is not available? That information, unfortunately, is not available. Yeah. 
So any other ideas people might have how what you know platforms can do specifically because they do have a lot of power and control to highlight or float up to the top certain people, people's contributions. Maybe you know you know it it might conflict a little bit with the governance structures, but I think actually it is the duty of platforms to try to moderate some of the negative effects of uh, social biases. Yeah, and in the case of Wikipedia, I, I wonder uh, from the people who are in the panel or in the audience, um, this is relatively complex, given that a part of a lot of the governance model and policy setting and enforcement in Wikipedia is happening uh, on the volunteer community front. Um, and then platform itself has uh, limited, uh, relatively limited uh, uh, control over what can be done. Um, in, in that case. Um, that if anyone on the panel has uh, comments on this or in the audience, that would be great to hear. And then maybe that can be the last comment on the panel and then we can switch to the audience questions. So having like encouraging badges, not to like, you know, um, like showing like Stack Overflow has done it in some cases successfully by uh, adding badges to users to some uh, to kind of guide the community's response to it. I mean, the paper showed what I talked about. It was like negative outcome of badges, but there could be some positive better ones. So you're not directly controlling what maybe what people are doing, but maybe by surfacing or highlighting some features of the community members, you're actually trying to encourage certain types of behaviors to so steer them towards the goal. So I have a lot of comments on this, but also we have a few minutes for uh, audience questions. So I'll keep those for now to myself and I'll follow up with you, Christina. Um, Isaac, if you can help us with the questions from the audience, that would be great. Uh, we've got a couple. The first one is for Jerome. Uh, it comes from Maria in the chat. And she says, what exactly is the difference between direct and indirect when you say women hate competition, at least indirectly? And how can it be seen or incorporated into the inclusion or exclusion uh, from the real virtual dialogue? Yeah, so I'm, I'm not sure I actually said indirect. Uh, if I said that, um, that was a mistake on my part. What I was saying was that um, apart from the concept of risk aversion and the concept of self-confidence, which is how much do you feel confident in the case of Wikipedia that you can actually engage in an argument and eventually effectively and eventually win that argument or push uh, your, your, your thesis. Uh, the taste for competition is about the structure of how you interact with people. So uh, is it that you're in a group and there is one winner or is it that we're all together trying to achieve something? And you know, in theory, Wikipedia is theorized as the latter. This is a cooperation endeavor. Uh, but in effect, the newbie experience often very much looks like a competition. I'm gonna win this over you. Um, and you know, there are some features that are um, embedded in the platform that, that kind of also create this. Uh, it could be possible to soften uh, the interactions that editors have right from the start uh, using clever social engineering uh, so that this impression doesn't come across that easily. Because this is really the factor that differentiates between uh, you know, successfully integrating newcomers, especially when it comes to women and minorities, as opposed to not. Great. Um, the next question comes from Saif. Um, Saif, I'm going to let you ask this unless you'd, uh, you'd like me to do it. Oh, uh, thank you. Um, hello, can others hear me? Yep. Oh, th th thank, you, thank you very much. And great panel. I'm really enjoying it. Um, so my question is, it seems, for instance, um, how do you guys feel that uh, your cultural background might be acting as a gatekeeper for Wikipedia? So for instance, you discussed that openness is very important for content production, but it might be that you're looking at this problem uh, within cultures who value openness. And uh, you, might not, you might have not yet studied 
how openness is currently affecting uh, in cultures that have conflict with, uh, with, with, with openness, uh, who might um, become, may, maybe they even freeze up uh, when they have to work with, with, with others. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious if you guys could talk about how you see that your own cultural background might be, affect, might be acting as gatekeepers for the results uh, that we're finding on, about content production in Wikipedia. Um, and thank you very much. I'm really enjoying this panel. Whoever would like to take the question, please. So, so maybe uh, I'll start. Um, so just uh, it's an interesting question. One kind of anecdote that comes up uh, in my own work is, um, you know, when I started looking at this, uh, when I started the project looking at ideological diversity and quality of pages, uh, I was, I had a, a result I expected, um, namely that the more I expected more diversity to ruin uh, the pages, and that, and that kind of prior was based on this research that um, I had been seeing, or I think is still kind of showing up. Of, you know, like fake news and media diets are especially like bad and conservative, like right wing circles, and it's like all fake news is shared by like the stupid. You know, there's all this research that I was kind of like consuming that was um, pointing to like the conspiracy theory like 2% are gonna ruin um, collaboration and things like that. So that's what I sort of planned on seeing in our data. Um, and basically the opposite appeared. I mean, I don't wanna completely pose those as two, like that we disproved that, you know, those, that research or anything. But uh, it's certainly like I disproved my own expectation um, and reliably showed that, you know, that it was like a pattern we couldn't make go away statistically or in any way that like, the more diverse, uh, ideologically diverse teams always create a better picture. Um, you know, and so that's just, um, I, I think, one example that, and so we wrote the paper with what the data showed us. It was not what I expected, maybe given my own, perhaps my own cultural bias in some way. Um, so it's just one example where the data really drove, uh, you know, the story. Thank you. Yeah, maybe maybe I can just add to that uh, a little bit. Um, I think that one great feature of Wikipedia is that it centers around languages. And so really the amount of bias that you have to manage is defined within subcultures. So I think that, you know, cultural diversity is certainly relevant, but in a sense, it's tackled at a level that is relevant to each culture. Not exactly so, because you know, languages don't really map onto cultures necessarily, but I think that's one of the strengths of Wikipedia that it allows to manage the amount and diversity of bias within a particular community, as opposed to imposing a certain view on everybody. And so in this respect, I think that in general, what Misha is saying, uh, you know, I don't know if he has studied other other languages than, than English Wikipedia. Most of the results I know of are for English Wikipedia, but that should translate, relatively speaking, to other languages as well. Thanks. The next qu question is from Jonathan, moving through the queue. Thank you, Isaac. Um, so I wanted to follow up on this, this idea of having two tiered systems. Um, or, or just more broadly, kind of having um, some amount of segregation, not necessarily in, in like in all the bad senses of that term, um, between newcomers or peripheral participants and uh, central participants. Um, and I kind of two questions about this. One is, um, is the purpose of these of the two tiered system to protect the newcomers from the community or to protect the content quality from the newcomers? Um, I think it's important to consider that directly because I think that I, you would create different mechanisms um, if your goal was to protect newcomers versus to protect content from newcomers. Um, the second question is, 
if you're going to have some sort of two-tiered system, which of course we do have aspects of this in Wikipedia, for example, English Wikipedia has a drafts namespace, although interesting corollary, the community is proposing getting rid of that drafts namespace. Um, Maker and I both worked on a project called Wikipedia Adventure, which created kind of a safe area for, for newcomers to, to edit. Um, if you're going to have a two-tiered system, um, how do you do with this problem of, or the potential problem of legitimacy? Um, if somebody's coming into the community and making edits, but they're not true edits, um, whether that's because they're in their user space or that's because they are only a kind of doing a certain number of things on articles, how do you make them feel like they're legitimate? Um, and therefore, you know, bring them closer into the community. And then how do you also project to the community, the core community, that these are legitimate contributions from legitimate participants and should be treated and evaluated accordingly? So two questions. One, what's the role, what's the purpose of the two-tiered system to protect the community that are the newcomers or protect the content? And two, um, if, uh, how do you make sure that if you're going to have a two-tiered system that you, um, preserve the legitimacy of the people who are participating in a more perfect sense. And if I can ask the panel to respond maybe in 30 seconds or a minute to this question so that we can conclude, uh, we can stick around and uh, continue the conversation after the panel. So, yeah, maybe I can say a couple of words, but Mako has not been talking, I'm sure he can say things about this issue. There is no way I can answer those questions in 30 seconds. <laughs> yeah, so I'm not going to answer those questions. Uh, what I'm going to say, though, is uh, that I think, I think it's mostly about, and, and you know, this should not come across as negative. I think this is mostly about protecting newcomers from the community in the sense of protecting newcomers from the type of interactions that established uh, contributors tend to have. Uh, and the quasi-legal arguments, very dry legal arguments that they enter into, which are off-putting and you know can be can be can be very stressful for for a newcomer. Um, and so I think this is this is this is what the purpose uh, of the, of a two-tier system should serve, and also put back the fun into it a little bit. Uh, it's not about quality, and this is something that you know uh, Mako probably can say something in 30 seconds. Having newcomers. Uh, his research suggests uh, does not undermine the quality of a wiki. Uh, this is, you know, a recurring argument about whether you want to allow anonymous contribution. So I will let him develop that point. Uh, so it's not an issue of quality to me. It's really an issue of how do you interact with other contributors and how would you manage this uh, dry self-assertive bureaucracy to put a little bit of the fun back. Now, definitely the challenge here is the issue of legitimacy, as you pointed out. People just want their stuff to go online. They don't want to have many gatekeepers. They don't want to have their stuff validated by, you know, 10 layers of authorities before they can actually see that they make a difference. So, you know, how do you get this equilibrium right is really the answer that I don't know and that we should collectively figure out. Thank you, Jerome. Meiko, any final remarks on your yeah, end? Yeah, very, very quickly. I think that, the, so I'll answer the first question, which is like, I mean, you can rephrase that question of what do we want? Do we want more participants or do we want like high quality stuff? And the answer of course is that we want both. Like the Wikimedia Foundation's mission is like literally part one, like we want to engage lots of people in production. And part two, we want to create like a valuable, valuable knowledge um, sort of resource that lots of people can benefit from, uh, for, for which quality is important. Um, and the problem is, that uh, although the, 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 there's a tension between those two. Um, and I think that figuring, we can, we, can, we can design better systems which reduce the severity of the trade-off that, that, that are caused by our you know, desire to navigate that tension, but I don't think that we're going to eliminate it. And yeah, the problem of course is always that we just, we want, there are many wonderful things in the world and we want them all and sometimes it's hard to have them all. Okay, hey, thank you so much, Meiko. Uh, everyone on the panel, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the time that you spent with us uh, for the interactions. Um, if you can go to this Etherpad link that I just put in the chat, there are a few questions from the audience that are not answered yet. So if you can enter your responses there, that would be great. And with that, um, I thank you and conclude the panel.